afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Vey, uh, director of the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Center of Transformative Placemaking at the Brookings Institution, and I'm a senior fellow with the Metropolitan Policy Program. On behalf of the center and on behalf of the program, I really want to welcome and thank all of you for tuning into our discussion today on who gets access to public space during a pandemic. So since the early days of COVID-19's arrival in the US, researchers, journalists, and other prognosticators have been circling around the question of the role of density has played in helping to spread the virus and in helping to mitigate its impacts. Urban Twitter has been a fire on the topic and a flurry of articles, blogs, and podcasts have explored the issue from many angles and with varying points of view. Density isn't a singular condition though, and how people experience it, good, bad, or otherwise, depends on the home in which they live, the neighborhoods that surround them, and the way in which they travel from one place to another. It is also often determined by the color of their skin and how much money that they have in their bank account. These disparities long predated the assault of COVID-19, but the virus has preyed upon them in some pretty horrible ways. New research by the Economic Innovation Group shows that over the past several decades, the number of high poverty communities and the number of people living in them has risen dramatically. And there are wide racial and ethnic gaps. Hispanic residents are four times as likely as non-Hispanic whites to live in a high poverty neighborhood. And black residents are nearly six times as likely. These are many of the same neighborhoods where low wage workers, many of whom are now finally understood to be essential experience many of the negative and today downright dangerous parts of dense urban living. They're the neighborhoods where housing conditions are crowded or substandard, but where basic goods and services are often sparse, where vacant housing may be ubiquitous, even while many of the residents are housing insecure. And unsurprisingly, there are many of the very same neighborhoods where the number of those who have become sick or who have died from the virus are the most concentrated. So we're not gonna tackle all these issues in our webcast today, but we are going to explore one key factor in how the conditions of urban density are felt. That is the extent to which people living in underserved communities have access to safe, high quality public spaces. So our discussion today is gonna to focus on the efforts of three organizations to provide equitable access to public spaces, both prior to COVID-19 and right now during the pandemic's reign. We will also explore how we can how we must be thinking far more expansively and creatively about how our public realm can be reimagined to confer health, social, environmental, and even economic benefits to far more people and far more communities. So I'm thrilled today to be able to have this conversation with three experts on these issues. Warren Logan, who's the Policy Director of Mobility and Interagency Relations in the Oakley Mayor's Office. Carol Coletta, President and C CEO of the Memphis, R Memphis River Parks Partnership, and Phil Myrick, CEO of Project for Public Spaces. So during the program, just um, one housekeeping measure, you can submit questions for panelists by emailing events at brookings.edu or tweeting to at Brookings Metro using the hashtag public space. So I'll try to ask some of these questions in our last 15 minutes or so of our webcast. So now I want to dive into it. So to start off, what I'd like each of you to do is to give a little bit of background on your work and your organization and how you've approached the issues of equity in the public realm prior to COVID-19. So let's start with Warren. Um, Warren, can you talk about some of the ways that Oakland has identified its underserved communities um, and has worked to expand and enhance mobility options for these neighborhoods? Um, what are the, some of the major equity challenges that your office has been trying to address? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I, and I'll actually start with basically your introduction, which is that the way that we identified the underserved neighborhoods, unfortunately, hasn't changed. The, the underserved neighborhoods have been the same for a very long time, and they remain underserved today. And, and that's really the, the foundation of where we started. So if you look at, for example, where redlining, um, where our redlining maps were in Oakland, and then overlap that with collision history in Oakland, or if you look at statistics for where people lack access to jobs or lack access to basic mobility solutions, all of those are the same areas. And so we we're really just digging into the exact same locations and saying, how do we provide a holistic view for, um, you know, addressing these historic uh, racial racist uh, injustices, quite frankly, um, and sort of looking back at the history of, of 
some of our more recent uh, transportation initiatives, the city of Oakland actually prioritized our, something as basic as, as road repaving, um, primarily in districts in East Oakland that have not received repaving in over a hundred years in some cases. And it may look kind of basic to just repave streets in neighborhoods that have you know, lacked that, but people take pride in public space when they are invested in. And so that's, that's just an example of the way that we look at that. Uh, moving forward, we also recognize though, and again, I'll re remind everyone that I'm the mayor's policy director for mobility and interagency relations, is that we can't just approach issues in a silo. So even though I work hand in glove with our Department of Transportation to address transportation challenges in, in Oakland and quite frankly in the Bay Area, I also recognize that we can't approach our community members, especially our, our disadvantaged black and brown community members with just transportation solutions. Because I may say, hey, do you want a bike lane? And they're saying to us, I want a job. I want investment. I want health care. And so we have to always be looking at this as a, as a holistic conversation. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more in our conversation, I think, but I, I'll leave it there for now, that that's the way that we approach uh, I'm sorry, my puppy is <laughs> licking my hand at the same time. I, that's the way that we approach <laughs> injustices in, in Oakland. Sorry. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so, Carol, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Memphis Riverfront Parks par Partnership and the ways in which a focus on equity is really integrated into so much of your work, from workforce issues, hiring practices, to the way in which you program your public spaces? It is. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Memphis River Parks Partnership is a 501c3. It's a public-private partnership. It's been in business for 20 years when long ago the city decided it could not care for its riverfront in the way that um, it thought it should and invited um, this organization to form and to do this work. So we manage five miles of riverfront. Uh, which for many, many years has not been thought of as connected even uh, park to park, north south along the Mississippi River, uh, but certainly not connected from west, uh, which is where our river is, back to the east and to neighborhoods. So this riverfront is adjacent to downtown, which is thriving, uh, but also three very impoverished neighborhoods that have all the health and economic challenges that uh, poverty brings. Uh, so, you know, when we think about the riverfront, we start, our mission starts with working with and for the people of Memphis. I don't care if you own a house, if you rent a house, if you have no house at all, if you live in the city of Memphis, you own a piece of this riverfront. So because we run public parks, we start, I think, with equity as an underpinning, you know, foundation for what we do. And then we pursue a, an equity strategy, I guess, at a high level or a general level as pay an opportunity for our employees, um, free quality programming for people with intentional mixing of people across incomes and across ages, uh, very aggressive MWBE contracting, as well as purchasing, uh, involving Memphians, a especially children in shaping the parks and their future. Um, and uh, also connecting, as I said earlier, connecting the riverfront back into neighborhoods that are most challenged. Great, thank you. Um, Phil, so Project for Public Spaces was established about 45 years ago to help people create and sustain public spaces that, that really just help to build communities. So how do you engage with communities to ensure that your projects aren't just accessible to diverse groups of people, but actually are designed by these groups so that the spaces are reflective of the vision, the values, and the needs um, of the population that they're really meant to serve? Sure, thanks, Jennifer. So our mission is really built around the idea that great public spaces strengthen communities and the people in them. Um, but also the public spaces are only able to fulfill that potential when the people who use those public spaces every day can take part in the process of imagining, you know, what, what uh, purpose they'll be put to and, and how, how they can be uh, a central part of the community, the community's life. And so, you know, this idea of community participation is really at the heart of our work. And if done the right way, um, you know, our, our process 
is around building trust and building social ties and that the public space becomes the setting for communities to build that trust among themselves. Um, but uh, projects that don't really meaningfully engage diverse audiences, they, they don't tend to have that same effect and they, they tend to underperform. Um, so I'll give you one example. Um, a lot of our work is actually in, in neighborhoods, in cities uh, that may be struggling uh, along various uh, metrics, you know, whether it's economically or losing population or fraying around the edges, losing their sense of identity. Um, you know, a few years ago in Detroit, um, working with the Kresge Foundation and, and one of the CDCs, um, the CDC had started a, a food growing program using local youth and was, you know, had asked us to take a look at you know, is there an opportunity here to improve the overall look and character of this little corner grocer that we want to improve and sell fresh food and this vacant lot that had this, you know, sort of decrepit old uh, basketball hoop. And so, but you know, you never know what the opportunity is until you start really probing what the neighborhood ideas are. So, you know, our engagement process you know, started in a somewhat traditional way, but it wasn't really reaching the right people. So um, some local folks suggested we do a, a festival. So we did a harvest party and all kinds of people came out of the woodwork. Um, I think about four or 500 people. And, um, you know, one of the placemaking outcomes was actually that they continued to do that, that festival year after year. But what we heard overwhelmingly was not concerns about the public space so much as you know how do we how do we get a job similar to warren's point that you know we can go in there with a preconceived notion maybe like biking is really important or you know this uh this this is one of the the big priorities or opportunities here and then you hear something completely different um and so in this case it transformed the project where you know in addition to this corner grocer and improving this this uh, decrepit lot uh, the decision was to put in a community kitchen and and that every block association leader got a key to that kitchen and they used it as a place to foster entrepreneurship and teach uh, cooking classes and um, you know people wound up starting small businesses out of that kitchen um, so it really you know we we have a certain expertise but community people bring you know the magic and if you don't listen to that and really combine uh, those, those ideas and combine the resources and expertise that all the different actors bring, including the community, projects just don't go the way they could and we can't address communities problems the way they want them addressed. Sure, well, you know, clearly I think for all of you, the fact that you've been focusing on these equity issues, you know, uh, prior to COVID has Put you in a much better position to be up to be trying to ensure that you have more equitable access to public space during this moment. So let, let's talk about some of those issues um, and particularly some of the equity challenges that have been exacerbated by COVID-19 and really just you know how your organizations are responding. So you know certainly we know that sheltering in place orders around the country have heightened the need to provide spaces whether that's parks and plazas, um, streets, sidewalks, where people can exercise, where they can recreate, where they can get a little bit of fresh air, um, where they can get away from maybe some of the family members or others they've been, you know, pulled up with <laughs> um, over the last uh, couple of months. And we know that this is really particularly crucial in communities where private outdoor spaces, such as yards or, or even balconies, are really limited or they're, they're non-existent. Um, and, you know, where their indoor spaces may simply be pretty crowded and pretty cramped. So, um, Carol, let's let's start with you on this. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges in Memphis in terms of safe access to public space during the pandemic, and how has the partnership been adapting its practices to expand and enhance that that access to parks, really for those who need them the most? Well, let me say our parks did not close during uh, at like parks in some places did. So, so. Our team has been coming to work every day. So when I think about safety, 
I worry first about my team because they've been out there every day doing their jobs that they normally do. So first and foremost, it's what about the safety of, of the staff? But what's been really interesting is to, and again, keep in mind, we would be considered uh, you know, on our way to being a glamour asset because we're on a river, but we're also in very close proximity to people uh, who are, uh, uh, their households are very low income. So, and what we've seen is during this time, they're coming and they continue to come. They come on foot, they come on bike share, which has been made free during this time. They come on scooters, uh, you know, they, they come in cars. And so uh, that's been really interesting. And as we closed our facilities, our restrooms, our parking lot, uh, they still found ways to come and they're there every day, every night. In fact, one of the beautiful things has been watching people, um, you know, sort of reassert what's great about public space. Uh, so uh, when gyms, are, you know, gyms have been closed, of course, all those gym classes now take place in the park and other people are joining in and I see it individually as well as groups, socially distanced, of course. And so that's been kind of wonderful to see. Uh, I'll just say one thing, our mayor uh, made a, a very sudden, I think unplanned, but very big move when he closed a major four lane road that separates our downtown from our riverfront, which creates access problems that we're trying to plan our way out of, but in the, in the near term, he closed that street and it has made um, the riverfront parks more accessible than ever before because people now don't have to cross four lanes of traffic uh, to get there and they don't feel threatened by those, that traffic. It's completely safe. And so people have taken up this wonderful, just strolling uh, a mile, out and a mile back every evening during sunset. And it really is just absolutely glorious. So, so access in terms of the space we manage has not really been an issue. Safety is always an issue, both for our staff. And then, and then our staff interacts with guests, uh, with, with our owners and uh, our stakeholders. And, uh, you know, we remind them of distancing when we have to, but we try to do it with a smile as, as hosts. Can I just ask one follow-up conversation? So obviously you manage, you know, a large um, acreage of parks along the river, and you, you noted that the parks in Memphis haven't shut down. Um, to what extent are there access issues around the city of Memphis? You mentioned people driving, for example, to the riverfront. Is that because they don't have nearby access in their own communities? Well, in part, it's because, I mean, it's two reasons, right? We've not, we like many other cities have not done a great job uh, in recent years of maintaining our parks uh, and doing the deferred maintenance. And, you know, we've seen this in cities across America. And that's one of the beautiful things about what's happened in the last decade, I think, is there has been more imagination, more investment in the capital uh, improvements in parks, um, and that's thanks to the work of a lot of uh, a lot of organizations. On the other hand, it's still tough to get any anyone managing a park, right? Any any eyes on the park in an official way, and and certainly it they're not always maintained in the way uh, that you'd like to see them maintained. So I think one of the reasons that people gravitate toward our parks on the riverfront is because we do have a higher level of maintenance and certainly a higher level of management, eyes in the park, people in the park. Uh, but you know, it, it's really, I think, uh, it, it's a point that Warren made earlier about thinking about this holistically. You, you can solve some problems by tackling parks, but it really, if you wanna so solve the problem of access to parks, then you've got to solve the planning issue. You've got to solve the budget issue. You've got to solve the transportation mobility issue. All of those things come together when we talk about access to parks. I mean, again, I would just say though, that um, while we work to get those holistic solutions and we all should, no matter what piece of this pie we're managing, I think we also have to start with the fact that those of us who are managing what is public, whether it's public transportation or public uh, libraries or public uh, parks, um, 
we shouldn't beat, our, beat ourselves up too much, right? Because we are at least providing that um, a free or low cost access to public. And I think we provide a foundation for our communities that are essential and to the extent that those, that is lifted up and invested in and more people want that, we build that political support that is so badly needed to maintain these assets, to develop and maintain and manage these assets at a very high quality so that people, no matter how many financial options they have, will choose public. And again, that helps the politics considerably. Mm -hmm. Carol, if you don't mind, I'd love to just tack on to one of your points that one of, so here, here in Oakland, um, we have a huge park that has a lake kind of dead center in, in the middle of downtown for all of the viewers out there. You're welcome to visit when all of this shelter in place is over. One of the challenges we've noticed though, in, in sort of the linchpin of all of these different issues that you and I have been highlighting is that there's this issue of trust. And I think that's that middle component that sort of everything else circles around because we've heard from a lot of our sort of black and brown communities that they don't trust that they're not going to be policed when they go visit a park. And that that has been this really critical element that is not just about physical access or even you know how I get to the park, whether it's well-maintained, et cetera. There is this distrust, understandably, that they're going to be policed differently when they're in a public space. And that's, I think, a component that I, I really want to highlight during this conversation is that especially during COVID, we're sending these mixed signals, right? We're telling people, stay inside because it's safe, right? Don't touch anyone else, don't spread the virus. And also saying, but please, you know, spread joy in the community when you're able to at a public park, stretch, relax, yoga, whatever. But there's this middle component that I think people of color are really challenged by, understandably again, that, that am I going to be arrested for going outside when you've just told me that I should be inside. That's, that has been a really big challenge for us. And I just want to sort of highlight that during this conversation as well. Well, and it's a, it's a very mixed message that we're all getting. You know, what do we do? Do we bring our workforces back into the office? Not what, you know, what are we supposed to do? So that's a challenge, I think, uh, but generally. But I think the, the, the problem you're highlighting is an everyday problem. And it's one of the reasons that we have sort of reorganized our staff uh, and our job descriptions. And we think about who is the mayor you know, of this park or who is the host of this park. And, and we try to get all of our rangers to think of themselves as greeters uh, and, and to sort of sp spread community. I mean, that's the idea and, and it's amazing the reaction that you get, but I agree with you. And I think the, the um, I think it's one of the sad things about not um, having people in our parks uh, on a regular basis. Uh, there's no one to organize the games, you know, there's no one to, um, and that's why I, I think that we are in a privileged position to be able to, to host and to have presence in our parks. And Memphis is, is a majority uh, African-American city in a majority African-American county in a metro area where the largest demographic is African-American. And so obviously our workforce reflects our um, population. And I think that lessens the concern and the trust, the, the lack of trust, but it doesn't eliminate it. It's, it's always there. And I think it's incumbent upon us to work hard to gain that trust. And I think it starts with just being, I mean, taking care of the place and being a friendly face and being human. Thank you. Um, actually, Warren, I'm gonna come back to you um, for a second. So, you know, there's been a, a really loud call in, in cities, not just in this country, but really around the, the world to prioritize the ability of pedestrians and bikers and, and others who are not in cars um, to prioritize them on, on public streets during the pandemic, particularly in really densely populated areas where sidewalks often don't allow the kind of physical distancing that we all need to be um, undertaking. So the, the city of Oakland uh, has restricted access on over 70 miles of streets within the city, um, which, is, which is pretty amazing. And I think you've really been at the forefront of this. 
So can you talk a little bit about like why and how you went about making the, the decision um, to do this? And particularly, how did you ensure that that decision benefited all Oakland communities? And, and as part of that, you know, in thinking about this issue of trust that you raised earlier, like have the decisions that you've made been pretty widely embraced or have there been some tensions? Uh, all great questions. And I, it's exciting to be a part of an organization that is willing to take risks, especially during these really challenging moments. So I just really first want to celebrate our safety team for really jumping into the deep end almost overnight into taking on this really fantastic effort. That said, let's start with the why. I think that, and I'm, I almost want to circle all the way back to my original point, which is that in some ways I, I shouldn't have to explain to anyone like why a Department of Transportation would want to encourage safe streets ever. And then more importantly, during a time when uh, our hospital beds, for example, are at limited capacity. And so I just want to like really underscore that this came from a, a public safety standpoint that here in Oakland, we recognize that like many other major cities, we have a really big uh, collision problem, especially fatal collisions between cars and people walking or bicycling. And, you know, we never want to see anyone dying on our streets. So like first and foremost, safety is always on top of mind. So that's when we think about the, the why, right? It is even more important than when we think about the fact that so many people are concerned about their, their public health and, and their safety in this moment of stress and, and challenges for COVID that we needed to take this even bigger jump to make sure that people were absolutely safe in whatever way we could. To speak to your how question, I think, you know, it was really exciting and, and quite fortuitous really that just last year we had adopted a bicycle plan that included thousands of people across the, the, um, the city engaging on what they wanted to see in their, when I say bicycle infrastructure, it's actually kind of funny because the plan, if, if you read it, I encourage anyone to read this plan, it's called Let's Bike Oakland. And it starts with the first chapter, which is called what, what we heard. And we heard a lot of different challenges that people shared with us, not just, I want to bike more, I don't feel safe bicycling. That's, that's sort of the bread and butter of bike ped planning. But also things like, I don't feel comfortable bicycling because I'm concerned that I might get arrested for potentially people thinking I stole this bike. That's a really nuanced approach to bicycle and pedestrian planning that requires some really deep listening. And again, I want to congratulate our safety team on like spending thousands of hours collectively asking these like very deep questions. Why, why, why? You know, it's, it's not just a matter of why don't you bike? It's like, why don't you feel comfortable doing something that I think you would in enjoy, but you're telling me you don't actually think is safe for you. So again, sort of circling back, we had this plan. We identified these uh, neighborhood bikeways across the city the 74 miles to be exact, and then just declared them safe streets, slow streets. And so it's actually kind of a, a funny story that we just reminded people of the neighborhood streets that they had just told us they wanted, that we were going to do it. So it's, in some ways, it's groundbreaking because it, we made the news a, a bunch of times. But also, if you look at what we did, we just reminded people that they deserved safe streets all the time. In terms of reception, though, I think it's been really all over the map. If you follow Twitter, people are really excited. And, and I don't want to use Twitter as a barometer for virtually anything other than Twitter itself. But I like Twitter anyway. But we have, a, the city is sort of makes an L. So you've got sort of everyone who's west of the lake and then sort of east of the lake, which is East Oakland, deep East Oakland, and then on into San Leandro, which is our neighboring city. But for half the city, they're saying, we need this permanently. This is fantastic. I'm rollerblading with my kids in the streets. This is awesome. That's North Oakland. That's, that's West Oakland, right? Then you have East Oakland, which is, again, sort of predominantly where people of color in our city live. And it's been a really challenging reception because I'll say, frankly, I feel like in some cases we might have missed the mark or that we have even more work to do. Some folks have said, this is great, but I don't bike, right? I don't even have time to walk outside because I'm actually an essential worker. And that's really, again, an interesting intersection that, that we didn't quite calculate on. The other issue though, and it's, I will say sort of frankly, it's, it's sort of heartbreaking to hear some of the deeper, almost uh, paranoid responses about safe streets. And I'll share one of them with you cautiously, which is that some people approached us and called me on the phone and said, I don't trust you to not arrest me 
when I use the street? Are you telling me that it is safe for me to walk and play in the street, in the same street that I feel over-policed in on a daily basis? Is this a trap? Is this a trick? And it kind of breaks my heart to have that as a response because, again, as a person of color, I, I understand that every day, no matter how much privilege I may have. And so I only share that as a story to kind of explain that the narrative around slow streets is really nuanced. And that in some ways I find myself sort of convincing people or trying to convince people that they deserve safe streets and safe access to their own front door, to their own streets. And having that conversation is really, really tough because originally when we, when we connected with our East Oakland partners, with our advocates, they said, why are you doing this? We need testing, we need masks. And again, that goes back to my holistic view, right? That we can't just approach people with a transportation solution when they're looking for another type of response as well. And very fortunately, we are now, you know, this is a very iterative process. We're, we're promoting soft closures on different intersections to promote additional safety. This weekend, we're actually partnering with our advocates to put out uh, free COVID-19 testing information on all of the barricades so that it's sort of doing double duty. So we really are trying to each week learn from what we're hearing and try and address people physically and figuratively where they are in place and in this dialogue. But to sort of answer your question, the reception has been kind of all over the map. But fortunately, our team is all ears. I mean, we have regular, like weekly, bi-weekly calls with people like, okay, how did it go this week? What can we improve on? And then that week, that weekend, we go out and fix something to make it a better program. Great, that was a, a great answer, very thorough answer. Really appreciate that because I think you probably answered a lot of the questions that I bet a lot of our, our audience uh, today has a, about the your street closure or restriction initiative. So Phil, um, the pandemic has is, is obviously been a particular crisis for one of our most vulnerable populations, the unsheltered. Uh, including both those who are in, you know, tenuous or kind of temporary housing situations, as well as those who are already really, you know, living in public spaces even prior to the, to the crisis. Can you talk a bit about how public space managers can, can work with our social services agencies and others to ensure that people experiencing homelessness are able to just meet their basic needs right now, um, such as food, hygiene needs, and access to shelter? Sure. You know, in normal times, public spaces are hubs for the community that often draw unhoused people who are, you know, looking for a place to hang out, um, maybe make some money, um, get information, uh, connect, get food. That's just been really exaggerated during the COVID-19 crisis, um, especially because a lot of the indoor spaces that uh, unhoused people uh, rely on are closed. You know, the other places are all shut down. So public spaces become more and more, you know, the default place for that, that activity. And, um, and so how to respond to that, you know, we're, we're seeing some really interesting success stories, um, which actually predate COVID, but that, that have, have really responded well uh, to the current crisis. So for example, Woodruff Park in Atlanta, um, which is a downtown small park um, that we worked with um, a, a couple of years ago with Central, Central Atlanta uh, Progress. Um, you know, when we started working uh, with Woodruff Park, of course, the initial idea was to create a great public space that's vibrant and fosters social connections for Atlantans. Um, but it's really become this more resilient space that um, has contributed to, to well-being even, even now. So during, you know, it had a homelessness problem uh, prior to COVID-19. And one of the ideas that we came up with was to actually, you know, we're big believers in park, in, in public space management, and that they're, you know, successfully, successful public spaces often need a presence on site to, to manage the the experience and uh, be the host and the ambassador, like Carol said, um, really critical role. In this case, I, th I think this is a, 
maybe the first time that we've done this, and I don't know of another example, but um, one of the staff people at Woodruff Park uh, that was hired was a social worker, like a licensed social worker. And so she is part of that small park staff. She is one of the ambassadors and she, she does a variety of things, but she's also a qualified social work who, worker who works with the houseless and homeless population in the park. So she gets to know them, she greets them, uh, she knows their names, she's building trust over time um, and she, she services them. So the, she, she'll ask them, uh, you know, what, what, how, what kind of help do you need? And she, she has, you know, her fingertips on all the city's resources in terms of agencies that can back up, you know, her offer. So during the last, I think, year and a half or so, she's uh, placed, a, you know, at least 300 people in shelters and almost 150 people in permanent housing just through being on site in Woodruff Park and being that person who's trusted and who's like this ongoing presence. So, um, you know, during COVID, she can play an even larger role in this task. Um, and, and during uh, the, the lockdown, of course, the homeless are almost the only people in that park as is the case in, in many public spaces that, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of other things that go along with doing this well. One is PPE, right, which we hear about over and over again. So how do you um, protect your service workers and, and your population who's in those public spaces uh, by approaching them with the safety precautions in place, like face masks and other PPE. Um, when it comes to uh, food distribution, uh, we've seen that uh, public space managers can really work with uh, public space experts, uh, sorry, city uh, uh, experts to provide food. A lot of these food shelters have actually shut down. And so they're looking for other ways to distribute food safely. So these public spaces can become a really important place to provide that role. Another, um, another interesting thing back to Woodruff Park is that they've actually brought in mobile washing stations. So they have a bathroom, they've kept it open through the lockdown, but they've, they've added um, these mobile hand washing stations so that there's an additional level of, uh, of hygiene that, that, that can help those folks who are spending their time there really protect themselves. You know, there are other examples um, like the uh, city of Portland, Oregon has uh, tried out these, these containers that are daytime storage units. So they actually, uh, they're supervised and lockable storage containers where, um, you know, people who have possessions but don't have a house can, can put them there and they can trust that they're kept safely and they're not gonna get stolen. Um, and, and they actually come with outlets and Wi-Fi because a lot of the, you know, this um, need for an outlet is, is vastly curtailed for, for the houseless population because, you know, they can't go into a restaurant, they can't go to McDonald's or Starbucks and charge uh, a device. Um, so, so that's another feature in that, in that um, storage container. So, um, you know, I just think, and I hope we'll continue to explore it. I think there's, there's an incredible range of ways that public spaces can serve the needs of, of people in a crisis, including, you know, um, temporary shelter. So, you know, we haven't seen very much of that in the news lately. I remember working years ago on a project in Armenia after an earthquake where the central square of Gumri, Armenia became temporary housing. And then we were able to come back as USAID had built permanent housing and was re relocating people to work with the population to reimagine again, well, how do we restore this iconic place as, as, a, as the heart and soul of, of the center of your city? But meantime, it did a really good job providing temporary housing through the kinds of shelters that um, aid organizations are able to bring in. Great. 
Uh, thanks so much. I mean, obviously, these are just really, really complex issues um, that are just made more, more vivid during this moment. So we've talked about, you know, where your organizations have, have been and certainly the range of things that, that you and, and other partner organizations are during, doing in this moment. But I want to pivot a little bit to, to look forward. So, you know, after nearly two months of lockdown, near lockdown in many states, um, the conversation is starting to pivot to, you know, how do we begin to reopen our economy safely? But it's, it's going to be a long, it's going to be a really difficult road and, and one that, that hopefully will lead us back not to normal, but to, you know, really a, a just far more just and a more equitable country. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what that future looks like in the context of public spaces um, in the near term, but also in the months and, and really in the years to come. So Phil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you for a second. Um, you know, many restaurants and other retail and service businesses have obviously been quite devastated by the pandemic, particularly many black owned businesses and those that are mm -hmm. located in, in low income communities. Um, yet, you know, even when those businesses are able to begin to reopen, when they're allowed to reopen um, for on-site patrons, demand's gonna remain pretty low if people don't feel safe and they don't feel comfortable or that they can be protected um, in those spaces. So as the weather in this part of the world warms, how can we start to be thinking a lot more creatively about opening the public realm? You know, streets, parks, parking lots, for businesses, um, for restaurants, you started to see a little bit of this in some of the cities, um, Pensacola, Tampa, and Florida, but also, you know, businesses like barbershops, um, which might be at least, at least while the weather's warm, a, a stopgap as we start to focus on reopening. Um, and, you know, how, do, how in that context can leaders really ensure that some of the most vulnerable businesses in the most vulnerable communities are prioritized? Well, so I'm going to answer your second question first, because then I'm going to follow that by a whole long list of ideas for how public spaces can be put to good use. But I just want to caution, you know, the priority has to be on these neighborhoods that need help the most. And the priority also has to be on working with those residents and find out where their needs are. So, you know, we can come up with a bunch of great ideas and they could be the wrong ideas. And we don't want to be the technocrats who are here to solve your problem without asking them first, what problems do you need solved, you know, above all else. So then to your first question, I, I really do think this is a time where we can think expansively about the role of public spaces and, and how they can uh, be put to a, a different range of purposes that we, we haven't necessarily seen traditionally, at least in North America. So, um, you know, for example, uh, the reopening of neighborhoods through public markets. Public, public markets are incredibly agile uh, and incredibly vital to bringing food to all types of communities, and they can operate almost anywhere. Cities, you know, we think should really be exploring how to expand and support their market systems and increase that, that food supply. Um, and bring food closer to where people are pulled up. Um, you know, Barcelona, for example, has a, a big market program where no resident is further than a 10 minute walk from a public market. We'd love to get to that point at some uh, someday, but you know, now we need to reach into those neighborhoods that are food deserts and markets is one way to do that. We need to look uh, you know, beyond parks to, like you said, Jennifer, parking lots, streets, alleys, all kinds of distributed public spaces that can reach closer to people's homes uh, so that they don't have to travel far. Uh, and then almost every conceivable use should be considered for opening up in the public realm because as the warm weather uh, visits us, there is more and more space that is safer to operate in out of doors than in. And so I think allowing businesses to open out of doors where they can at least do some of their operations is a really exciting prospect. Now, again, to Warren's point, it would be very easy for this to become over-policed. And so um, I, would, I would favor, you know, if, if cities can sort of create these 
bureaucracy-free zones and allow things to go outside that, that under normal regulations would never be permitted. Um, and for the regulations to focus on health and safety, obviously, and physical distancing, and the kinds of, uh, the kinds of guidelines that help these things uh, uh, roll out successfully, like we've done with public markets in three cities, you know, we're working with Arup to define very clear guidelines for spacing out vendors and shoppers so that they can go ahead and operate safely. But anyway, so I think outdoor restaurants, outdoor food, outdoor vending, uh, different types of retailing, um, and then services, you know, uh, you mentioned haircuts. I think, you know, we could be ready for that uh, soon. Laundry pickup, uh, drop off, uh, pet grooming, manicures, pedicures, uh, uh, services like meal distribution and the temporary washrooms, uh, like they've been doing in some public spaces, health clinics, uh, some neighborhoods, you know, housing may be what they need and a parking lot might be the place to put it. Um, civic uses, you know, public free civic uses, hopefully. So I think we, we need to start thinking about this. How, how would we safely roll out an exercise class um, in the street, uh, walking classes, recreation programs, um, you know, libraries that use more of their outdoor space than in, um, vegetable gardens. Can we set up vegetable plots in, in the street, in the parking spaces? Um, I don't know, Jennifer, maybe we could do safe dance parties in the street. You know, maybe we'd have to mark it off so that everybody's 10 feet apart. But, you know, you can imagine one of those silent dance parties uh, happening in the streets of Oakland, right, Warren? I mean, I think, I think when, we, when, we start to, when, we start to, when we start to explore these things, it could actually become a, a really soulful experience for all of us who are looking for, you know, we're dancing on our balconies right now and we're clapping for the, for the, uh, the emergency response workers, but uh, we, we, need, we need to expand that, that menu and, and tap our local talent, tap our local artists, tap the, the ideas of people in the, in the community. You know, we want the micro mobility too, to get, you know, uh, around town and, and to, to our places of work. But I, you know, I guess, I think the combination of these ideas can create these, these really unusual experiences that put our communities back together, both economically, but also just in terms of our, you know, our connections to other people and bringing healthcare sure. um, and, and place management into neighborhoods that haven't seen them before. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the one towards really creativity. Yeah. What's the point? So, oh, so Warren, I wanna, <laughs> I wanna pivot to actually and talk a little bit about, you know, building on some of the comments that Phil said, um, and as we even think beyond kind of the reopening, you know, even, even in the context of street, you know, restrictions, you know, people have been calling for this certainly prior to COVID. So how, how permanent do you think we can, we can make some of this, this reopening of public space? Um, and do you see that happening in, in Oakland or eventually are we just gonna kind of, you know, go back? I'm gonna step aside from that question a little bit because I'm not allowed to say that any of this can be permanent because it's all a pilot. But I can tell you that for sure, the thing that we're taking from this that is absolutely permanent is the lessons learned. That this is in fact possible, even if we change it completely in the future, right? That, that it is in fact possible to close a bunch of streets overnight and that the sky won't fall down. To touch on Phil's point, I, I just wanna to add to that because I know we're short on time as well, that we are sort of exploring the like, maybe we expand parklets around our businesses. Let's do street closures on the weekends, like Sunday streets. The big issue here though, in thinking about our communities of color and our, and our sort of disadvantaged businesses is that it's one thing to just say, okay, you can request a parklet, but it's an altogether different effort to look at the, the regulatory scheme around how to get a parklet and say, can we make this easier? So just very technical for the folks, you know, listening at home, that we're thinking about adjusting the, the permit itself to make it just super simple. Like, idiot proof and also free so that you can apply for these types of mechanisms and then thinking okay in advance of that parklet that you're going to want to request do you need a business permit to adjust that you can operate alcohol outside okay can we 
adjust the cabaret license that goes along with that. And if you need a, um, there's a sound ordinance that we have. Okay, can we adjust that as well? So that all of this can be super streamlined and really simple for folks to just get back to business immediately. So it's, it's not just opening up the public space, but it's also opening up the regulatory schemes that made all of these things sort of challenging just from a, a paperwork process and quite frankly, saving my staff some time going through all that paperwork as well. So I just want to lift that up as well. Yeah, and certainly these are the things that we should be thinking about, you know, in terms of permanency. Probably some of these things should have been done a long time ago, and maybe this is the moment to, to ease up on some of these regulations. Um, so Carol, I'm gonna, uh, you know, ask one sort of meta, meta question here, um, and then I'm gonna combine it with one of the questions that, that came in from, from one of our, our viewers. So in an earlier conversation that, that we had, you really emphasized this point that parks and other public spaces just really need to be considered essential infrastructure. And so do you think that the pandemic is actually going to help us shift in that direction? Or do you think in light of, you know, all the fiscal challenges that, that cities um, are going to be under um, as, you know, in the, in the months, in the years to, to come, that actually the opposite might happen and that we'll start to see less investment in not just, you know, creating new public um, spaces, but even in maintaining them. Um, and then that that means, you know, equitable access to the spaces will just become more limited and not and not less. Um, and I'm going to sort of combine that with, a, with another question I'd like to, to respond to because I thought it was an interesting one. And maybe this gets to part of this issue about, you know, maintaining spaces and creative ways to do that um, is do you see that, you know, there's a role for um, new creativity even around workforce and hiring in kind of, you know, WPA style projects around tree planting and, and maintaining that may then help mitigate some of the, the fiscal constraints, um, depending on, on, you know, who, who pays for it. Uh, those are uh, good questions. Uh, I, I think that I, I certainly hope that uh, we, if ever we needed proof that parks matter, we've had that over the last um, month and a half, two months. So I, I would hope that parks, in fact, will be considered uh, essential infrastructure. I also believe it's incumbent upon those of us who run parks to demonstrate that parks can be more than simply play and recreation and health. Totally essential. Uh, benefits uh, for the community, but uh, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this decimation of Main Street America. I was a small business owner, my daughter owns a restaurant, and I keep thinking if, if how, are, how will local and small businesses come back, and what role can uh, public space play in helping them get back and giving them cheaper options in terms of how to do business um, less frequently, less demands, uh, perhaps as Warren says, with less uh, bureaucracy. And so that's something I'm thinking a lot about and how could we Im help imagine that, create that and host that uh, for small businesses. In terms of um, uh, the role for new workforce, I think workforce is a place, frankly, that we are not thinking big enough in the country. And um, that then makes it very difficult because of financial flows to think big enough at city levels. Uh, certainly, we have an opportunity to uh, give people things to do and meaningful things to do on a volunteer basis. But, um, you know, where we've lost a lot of earned revenue and, and uh, a lot of people are taking, you know, municipal budget cuts in our world. Um, it is very difficult to think, well, where would we get the funds to employ more people? I mean, it's just uh, tough to think about. But if uh, we had federal consideration, you mentioned WPA. I mean, we can put those people to work all day long and in meaningful jobs that gain skills and move you on to the next level. I worry about the internships, the paid internships for, um, you know, kids in high school and college. And the, that missing out on that, I mean, which is very much needed income and very much needed skill building uh, and just learning the ways of, of work, uh, is, it's going to be missing this summer and I think we'll all be the poorer for it. 
Yeah, no, it seems like there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, we already know that we have a lot of issues around, you know, youth, um, that kind of that missing group um, and their ability to be employed, even, you know, certainly prior to COVID. And so this could really be an opportunity to think a little bit more expansively about how to, how to engage that youth to get their sort of foot in the door, while at the same time, you know, maybe, you know, having that opportunity to maintain parks in their own neighborhood. Um, so I want to ask, I have an interesting question here that we haven't really touched on so much. So I'll, I'll throw it out to the group. I'll paraphrase it a little bit. But it really gets it's sort of issues around the digital divide. Um, you know, one of the things we're hearing about is for people that don't have good internet access at home, they're driving to parking lots and sitting outside of the public library, which, which has, you know, in many cases, um, allowed uh, their, their Wi-Fi in the public realm and, and are sitting outside of, you know, restaurants or other things that have that Wi-Fi access. Um, but what, what does it really mean when we think about this digital divide, how the public realm um, can start offering, certainly not just now, but beyond that, um, more access to help bridge some of those digital divide gaps. Um, and, you know, as we think about 5G digital capacity um, and, uh, and even, you know, this even ties into a bit of conversation about, you know, just wiring in general and kind of smart cities concepts, energy efficiency and others. What is that, how, how, what are the opportunities there? Well, I mean, just to say, I think the opportunity is obvious. Why do, why do parks and public libraries exist? They exist because uh, most of us can't afford to have our own park or our own library. So we collectively, the we, um, build parks and public libraries. So to the extent that we can't all afford um, great digital, then we put it in a public place so that we can share it in common. That's what civic commons really ought to be about. So I think there are, I mean, that's one of many things that we could, we could pool our resources, if you will, under the guise of, you know, under the banner of public and uh, think about doing together today. Carol, I would I think add if you, to your point. If you follow the example of the city of Portland. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Phil and then Warren. You know, the city of uh, Portland, that container idea that was focused on safe storage of people's possessions, but with Wi-Fi and outlets, you know, that's, that's an idea that is infinitely expandable. And maybe that's something that we need to start looking at um, in terms of there being these pods that can be delivered to locations in neighborhoods that don't have, you know, any good Wi-Fi and, you know, they can't get to a downtown location where there is public Wi-Fi uh, but it, the Wi-Fi can come to these neighborhoods along with, you know, a set of other services um, that, um, that can be, you know, including, you know, meals, um, programming, portable libraries, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways that you can think about that, that, that idea. Phil, you want, or, uh, Warren, you want to jump in? Sure. I, echoing both of their points, I, I'll just share one of the challenges we've noticed in Oakland is, and I bring up the children that you kind of pointed out, Carol, that you know, as kids are now learning in at their homes, the biggest gap has been access to not just internet at all, but high speed internet. Because if your parents are working on laptops from home, you've got a brother and a sister who are also trying to learn digitally. I am on call, Zoom calls all day, happily, uh, with colleagues that are like, hold on, I got to find the good Wi-Fi in the corner because my kid's in one corner. And it's that is a big challenge. I think it's raising this this issue that maybe 10 years ago when cities started exploring the idea that that like everyone should just have free Wi-Fi or, or high speed internet, I don't think people took that seriously. And now I, I want us to return to that issue because as we are starting to look at like what should be permanent, when I think about the congestion and the air quality that has been such a big issue for most all cities and especially in the Bay Area, one of the things people have noticed is that we can address congestion on our freeways with better Wi-Fi service at home. And that's not a linkage that we typically think about, but it's something that I've been really encouraging our regional planners to consider is that we need to explore these types of solutions in the in this sort of digital divide space as well. Great. Yeah, you know, I can totally relate to, you know, having a husband, three kids all working working, schooling from home. I, I just kicked everybody out <laughs> today just to make sure that you. my Wi-Fi capacity can handle this webcast. So um, it, is, it is really a truism. 
Um, and hopefully this will, you know, spur us to think about bigger and better solutions to bridge some of these divides moving forward. So we are at time in another 30 seconds. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this be a wrap. Um, look, I really just wanna thank all of you, the panelists um, for sharing your insights today, for taking the time. I think this has really been, been fantastic. And I know I learned a lot from the discussion. Um, I certainly hope our viewers learned a lot from the discussion as well. I'm sure that they did. And that, you know, that we're all really inspired to, um, to integrate a lot of what we learned into our, into our work, into our work now, into our work in the future. So again, thanks to the panelists. Thanks to all the viewers for tuning in. Um, if you want to watch it again um, or want to tell friends, uh, this has been recorded. So there will be an opportunity um, to, to, to view it or to pass it on moving forward. And we'll make sure everybody gets, gets a, a chance to, uh, to do that. So uh, thanks, everyone. And please be well. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.